Welcome to TSP Weekly. This is your tech startup podcast for Thursday, November the 6th, 2014. Today we are once again recording in the Velocity Garage here in Kitchener, uh, in the Strong Bad Room. Once again, we've been here a few times. Um, very always strong. happy to be here. Yeah. Not like, very bad. No, but it's, it's, yeah, it's getting familiar, which is nice. I'm glad they finally wrote This Is Not a Whiteboard after seeing so many things written on that wall on in the, the past. On the painted wall. They've kind of come to realize that it's uh, not supposed to be there. Just a quick disclaimer before I introduce everybody else. Um, I'm, I'm dealing with some voice issues here. I've, you know... I won't get into too much graphic detail, but you know, waking up with stuff running down the back of your throat is not very conducive to, you know, having a good voice. Um, so you still are Darren Connolly, the I still host am. Yes, and, uh, tech entrepreneur, local tech entrepreneur. We haven't replaced our our fearless leader. No, well, this and, isn't Barry White hosting the show today. <laughs> and I appreciate you a covering my introduction for me and b <laughs> complimenting me on my voice. I'm hoping it makes me sound sexier and not just sicker. Absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, anyway. I'm thinking about moving a little closer to you already. <laughs> I think we should just stay where we are. But anyway, <laughs> here, let me introduce uh, my co-host here, Stephen Campbell. Um, local tech entrepreneur also. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing better than you are, I think, today, okay. uh, health-wise. I got the strangest phone call from my wife today. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, little puppy dog that we just got is in um, being, I'm not sure if it's spayed or neutered. I guess he's being spayed. Right. Um, and so the during his operation, uh, the, the pet hospital called to ask if we wanted to have his baby teeth removed. Uh huh. Um, so that was a strange phone call for us to receive that uh, he's under, he's yeah. doing fine, but would you like us to go ahead and remove, pull his baby teeth while, while we're, you know, at yeah. it sort of thing. It's, it's like we, he's unconscious already. What yeah. other parts of him would you like altered yeah. while we have the opportunity? Very strange. I had already signed yeah. off that I didn't want intravenous f fluids done with him and I didn't want a microchip put in sure. and I didn't want his toenails trimmed. Right. So that was about $300 in extras that they had offered, good upsells. You know, but I've never had the upsell pressure of your dog is in surgery. Yeah. Do you want us to, like, we yeah, didn't even know that that was a thing you could do. It Please makes me wonder, like, when I've been under, I've had a couple of surgeries in the past myself. I was, you have to has ask Has anybody got a phone call <laughs> yeah. saying, like, Honey. what else do you want done to him yeah. while he's down there? <laughs> yeah, strange. Well, let's introduce our guest <laughs> on that uncomfortable note. Uh, joining us today are Laura Austin and Beth Neninger. <laughs> Neninger. That shouldn't be difficult for me to say. You got I think it. everything's a little bit more difficult for me to say today. Uh, they are co founders of Drafting Space. Um, and we, we were actually supposed to have them on on a previous episode, but they've been so crazy busy with how well their startup is going that, uh, that we had to reschedule. So we're very glad to have them here today. Welcome, guys. Uh, Thanks. Good to have you with us. It's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank awesome. you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit of tech news and uh, hopefully get some input from you guys, too, see what you think about some of this stuff. Um, first thing on the list is uh, a new app called Odyssey. And... Um, Nothing too amazing. I think we've seen a lot of apps that kind of do the same thing, but um, Odyssey, uh, their selling point is they'll allow you to back up your mobile photos and videos to your home PC automatically. Um, so instead of just kind of putting everything in the cloud, we know that there's been some security issues lately with uh, you know getting things in the cloud hacked. Um, <clears throat> This way, um, and I think a lot of people back up their stuff to their home computer anyway, but this way it kind of happens automatically. And they have a few extra features like um, you can decide to kind of automatically share any of your content with, I, I guess, with anybody. But uh, the way that they're kind of marketing is, you know, if you have a spouse, then um, your spouse can see all of the pictures that you're that you're taking and backing up um, sure. through like a, a social kind of sharing feature um, or videos. I know for my wife and I, like each of us have at times taken individual videos or photos of our kids. And then it's, it just kind of, if we happen to show the other person, great, but it doesn't always kind of happen that way. Um, so it, you know, I, I kind of like this idea that we can kind of be sharing as it happens, but uh, anyway. Yeah. I don't um, know who the target know, market think? for this is because I'm not, it's such a, sort of a convoluted market to me as a picture taker and a video taker. And I'm an Apple iPhone user. So we have a lot of built in functionality, I believe. Sure. And my wife and I are able to share a shared folder of pictures. Right. Um, and we didn't even do that. Uh, we have the option. It takes a lot of time to go in and label all your pictures and do all that kind of stuff and put them into the shared folder. And so we've recently discovered that and are doing it. Mm. Um, but geez, it wasn't for a couple of years after our iPhones were, 
um, purchase that we sort of started to use that functionality. So I don't see me going out to f purchase or to find an app to do that. But you said it's a lot of work to get them all. Yeah, it was. Up. Well, so it was a lot. It happens automatically. Right? Yeah, it took me two years to find it. Right, oh. <laughs> or maybe it was an iOS eight update. Sure, uh, probably was what happened. So now sure. it's doing it automatically. Right. Um, but you have to sort of select each picture and move it over into a shared folder. And so there is some manipulation that you have to do. So I think this that should be a selling point for you to want to use something that does all that automatically for you, I would think. No? Yeah. I don't know if that's enough um, of a value uh, differential. I'm okay. certainly not going to go download an app because Apple does it, right? No, fair enough. Um, but as an Android user... Again, I didn't even discover the ability to do it because yeah. it wasn't on my radar really. And now that I have it, I sometimes do it. Yeah. So I don't. I'm maybe not the target market for these guys because I don't like that. Doesn't excite me much. I'm not running out to uh, to, to check it out. This? Or no. What Fair about, enough. What are, what yeah. What do you guys think? think? <laughs> yeah. Could you I, see yourself using something? I like would that? say the same thing about being a little bit confused about who's for because you know for me it's pretty easy. I. You know, I plug in my iPhone to update it, and I get all my photos on my computer, and I can share them with whoever I want. So it's, it mm. seems like that's already a pretty a easy feature for me to use. I'd say someone like my mom has a little bit harder time with it, but then I look mm. at something like this, and, well, I don't, I don't think she'd have any easier time, you know, sort of figuring She's out a new program. and Yeah, so right. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't know anyone personally who would really be interested. Hmm. Interesting. What yeah, about yourself? I'm not sure. My phone is ancient. It's like four years old. I have an iPhone 4, and I don't remember the last time I backed it up, and oh. it, it's like maxed out storage. <laughs> you should back know. it up. You're going to lose all the photos. I should be, be sad. Like, it, but yeah. I don't see myself using it either. Yeah, it's, well, it's probably about time to do some sort of backing. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> if you have a puppy dog or a, a little pet or something, and four-year-old pictures all of a sudden yeah. disappear, that could yeah. be... Uh, it is, it is so sad when you lose all your pictures. My mom, she recently went on a trip uh, to Europe and she visited both my sisters there. Oh, cool. And then um, she came home and she dropped her iPhone at the gas station oh. and drove away. Like it, oh, like, forgot oh. it, lost it. Yeah, and she came back like five minutes later realizing it was gone and someone had already taken it. And so wow. all her photos from her like big trip to Europe were gone. So wow. I think there is sort of, you know, there is value in being able to keep your pictures. But Yeah, for sure. You said all your sisters are in Europe? Mm -hmm. wow. I have two sisters who live in Europe. Oh, very cool. cool. No, I just find that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I have a sister-in-law who, who lives in Europe as well. But anyway, oh, cool. Uh, cool stuff. Um, you know, I think, I don't know, I'd like to say like this is something that I'd really like to try simply because I just said like my wife and I do want to be able to kind of share what we're each you know doing as far as our photos and videos and stuff. But... I think it's maybe the lazy factor. Like, I don't really feel like going out and installing a new app, setting it all up, like making sure it all works. I, yeah. So maybe maybe the target market isn't quite as wide as one might think, right? If right. it's if it's too much work to actually like get it in the first place and make it happen, maybe it's something that has to kind of be pre-built into the the uh, you know the the app, the default app for photo sharing on your phone, and then people would take more advantage of it, I guess. Yeah. Perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, All I think right. they've got their challenges yeah. ahead of them, so I wish Fair them enough. luck. Well, maybe if they listen to this podcast, they can let us know if they're getting some traction. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let's talk about our next one here. Um, we have another app called Boop. and uh, Bip was taken. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised Boop was available, actually. <laughs> but uh, um, this one's kind of playing in the same space that um, something like Snapchat uh, and and now a lot of kind of Snapchat copycats are in this space too. So being able to send self-destructing messages. Uh, what makes this one unique is you can send animated messages. So um, it has you know a bunch of different icons and emoticons and things like this. And uh, so you can compose a message with text and with these pictures that uh, that has you know. Uh, a certain amount of animation, some motion. Um, the the text for the message actually pops up one word at a time. It doesn't display it all at once. So um, I think they're trying to, um, you know, go kind of one step beyond Snapchat and in, in making it harder to capture, you know, the whole message with one screenshot. You're only going to get one word max, kind of thing, right? <laughs> um, unless you're doing like a video capture or something, I guess. But uh, yeah, so so the message kind of plays back and then disappears. Um, and, and it's got a little more, I don't know what you call, spiced up display with the animation factor uh, added in. So first of all, let me ask you guys, does anybody use 
Snapchat or or any other kind of app that has like a self destructing feature when it sends the messages. I've I've never tried Snapchat myself. <laughs> Laura yeah, sent me a Halloween <laughs> Snapchat recently of oh. a of a skeleton in our house doing um some various different <laughs> Cal- calisthenics. <laughs> so, so yeah, we, we had a Halloween party and then uh, we made this like well it was mostly Laura's project. She made this like hanging dead body that Great. had like a skeleton face. Wow. And um. Then afterwards, we're like, oh, what do we do with this thing? And we're like, it'd be really funny if it was just like in like regular, doing like regular ordinary things, you know, like eating breakfast, like watching TV. Sure. And so she made this like epic Snapchat of this skeleton, like <laughs> doing all these things. And it was really creepy, but I enjoyed it. Did you name it uh, Bernie or anything? Or what's I the. I should have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. Did it, but did it have to be a Snapchat? You didn't want to preserve it for posterity or anything? Um, no? Yeah, it would have been nice to keep it, I guess. But I was it's funny to send all my friends and creep them out, I guess. Oh, okay. Do you, dead bodies do have a shelf life. <laughs> That's what I've heard. So. Have, Stephen, have you ever used I thought that this was made for me as a 30 something ish. Really? Um, I you love, send a lot of incriminating messages that you don't want evidence. Yeah, I love the yeah. uh, I love the self destructing message because I get the Maxwell Smart reference to that. You know, so, okay. Um, but I'm not a huge animated GIF person. Sure. So uh, I I feel like they're trying to train the old guy to use the animated GIFs with the self destruct. I don't know. If it's so much GIFs. It's just, I think they just have icons that you can animate. The motion of them, or that's or how confused I am. Them, I think right? they're using gifts in it. So oh, that's, that's how far away I am from Snapchat <laughs> and self-destructing <laughs> messages. Fair enough. So I'm okay. uh, if I if you didn't think I was the uh, market for Odyssey, yeah, I am definitely not a blooper <laughs> or a Fair blooper. Enough. A blooper. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, but I should try it. I you know. Uh, yeah. Honey, we need milk. You need. You have three seconds to read this text message. <laughs> well, this is more else. But this is my actual concern with the self-destructing messages. Like, what if I get it while I'm driving or something? I'm. I'm like. I have right, to read I've, this. I've, if I miss a word, then I'm gonna <laughs> not get the whole thing. Meanwhile, like, I have to make sure I don't rear end the person in front of me, or like, I don't know. I've. I've never. I myself have never really been sold on self-destructing anything so far on on the internet, and may, like maybe. I don't know. Maybe I just haven't fooled around with some of these apps enough. Do you delete your old emails? No. No, I, I don't. I use that. Gmail, so it all just sits there. Just right? sitting there, yeah. And and same with my text. I've never deleted I, that I can remember a text message ever. So, you know, I just try not to have like incriminating conversations right. <laughs> in general. Right. And uh, I put and my account so number in here first. somewhere. Just scroll back up through four years of well, chatting to find. You my... know, yeah. <laughs> so. I don't know. Like, do you, is this a? Do you think this is a good selling point, guys, to have something like this? Or, I don't know. I would try it out, but it seems like a lot more effort than Snapchat because mm. it's just like taking a photo and sending it so quick. Right. But yeah. like constructing this animated message hmm. seems like a lot more effort. So there's too much yeah. user friction for you. You don't want to sign in and log in and do all that kind of yeah. stuff. Where Snapchat is, it, it's easy enough and quick enough, and so it's a UX yeah. thing almost for you. Yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, how do you even compose these messages? You have to, like... Just think it. Do you have to draw, like, a flash (laughs) animation? It just seems like a lot of effort. Or you only get, like, four presets, sort of, like, you can get, like, the animation of the taxi driving to the store, and the, like... Maybe. Like, I, they, the article doesn't go into a lot of detail, I guess, as far as how to actually construct it, but I would assume they've tried to make it as easy as possible for people, right? Like, this, that's kind of, like, UX 101, right? Yeah. So, um... It reminds me yeah. a little bit of uh, Microsoft where they used to have that clip art library where you had like mm. a preset of like all of these relatively ridiculous like little yes. icons and you would choose them and you would put them in your school reports for your teacher. Right. And it, it makes me think of something like that where you, you have like a very, uh, a finite set of um, yeah. icons, I guess, that you can, you can share with people. Sure. Yeah, that's true, right? And I guess, yeah, if people get bored with the icons, maybe this is like a selling point for monetization where you can buy new packs of graphics or something <laughs> that you can use or, or whatever. At the very least, you can still animate the text, but you're still going to have to type in all that text at the very least, right? But, yeah, I want to text my wife that I love her, but I have to download a, a heart pack for $2. So I, I got to say I'm out. Yeah, and, <laughs> and something like I love you can probably be sent in a way that That's you want to preserve pack. it for the future, though. Right? right. Like, you don't need that to dis- I don't want anyone to know I told yes, you. you got three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, that could be a thing with kids these days. Like, my 13-year-old could send something to a girl, and it only for three seconds does he have to proclaim that love, and then... 
she can't show anybody that. And mm -hmm. he's told her that he's uh, a fan of hers or, I don't know. The, Maybe. The, a lot of times I think the target market is found through discovery of... Yeah, you know, like, there's one thing that I think would be really useful for this, and that's I always forget my SIN number, and then mm. I have to call my parents and like, oh, what's my SIN number? So right. they could just like send me like a self-destructing like right. SIN number. But you that gotta, would be perfect. You've yeah. got like a half a second to read it and remember it, right? Like if you miss it, okay, can you send that again? Sorry. Like, can yeah, you put different self-destruct times on it, like six seconds or four seconds? You know, if if I had read the article more thoroughly before we started recording, <laughs> we have a lot of I'm questions sure I for could you tell you whether this. that's a bit. I I don't remember seeing that that. Uh, uh, is I did possible. read the article and I didn't see it either. But yeah, fair enough. I'm we'll, guessing we'll put a call into him. Yeah, if that was if that was a feature, we probably would remember. But yes, fair enough. Um, well, you know, I. Overall, I think there's just a lot of these kind of copycat apps that are coming out based on the Snapchat idea or adding an extra gimmick to messaging or something, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and this is another one in, in a very large pile of apps all in that space. So, um, you know, I wish them luck if it goes somewhere, but uh, I think they've got a lot of, there's a lot of noise in that space that they've got yeah, to Yeah, and I, through, it's right? almost, for me, it's almost like a, I have not divided my um, communication as far as texting into frivolous fun texting and this is kind of serious texting it's all the same to me so yeah. there's an expectation of social expectation for most of the people that i text with that you'll respond and you know there's some sort of social guidelines there yeah so when you have this kind of a thing it's got to be for me it would have to be so sort of off the social norms for if it's a self-destructing message it's got to be nonsense content or i guess you yeah, could use it for like passwords ridiculous. and stuff right but you have to be able to say to your wife look if you send me one of the self-destruct messages, don't get upset if I don't respond or if I miss it. Or And those things in social texting context are, you know, kind of yeah. normal things that you have to respond. Did you get my text? No. Well, what this, happened? And you know, it, might why? Be, it might be a generational thing, too, because we're pushing 40, or one of us might be above might be it already. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think we're, we tend to use kind of texting and chatting for like practical purposes sure. like I don't I wouldn't just sit around and for fun spend an evening texting do you yeah. know what I mean yeah I would do that if I'm setting up an appointment or like hey let's let's get, grab a beer or something like I wouldn't be you know chatting with my friends via text so you night. guys who are looking yeah. at 40 uh, from a distance <laughs> <laughs> do you guys sit around and just chat with each other for or text or, yeah that's what I mean no. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not like I half the time don't have my phone on me. I'm probably mm, yeah. <laughs> my boyfriend calls me the least tech tech person because <laughs> I never answer my phone. That's yeah. kind of refreshing though to find that there are people out there that are not like glued to their devices still. Yeah, that's cool. Laura? I kind of um like the self destructive thing because it sort of mimics a phone call. You don't record a phone call. Right. You just hang up Maybe and then you it's... don't record a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. are aware that you're being recorded right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of it's kind of nice because it's just like you hang up and it's done and then you don't have that anymore. Just mm. like this, it goes away. Yeah, that makes sense. I had a, an interesting discovery that I'll share with you with my 13 year old, and uh, my mother was able to bring some clarity to this for me. Um, and that happens even at 40. I have bad news for you. <laughs> or good news, maybe. You know, <laughs> that mothers can still do that. Um, but um, with his texting and starting to get interested in girls, um, my wife and I were at the beginning thinking of we got him his iPod that he could text with people. And that's how he communicated with a lot of uh, young girls. So we were telling him we're going to be reading those texts so that he was aware mm -hmm. of the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, there was some chaperoning of his communication online. Um, and he was okay with that, but a little cranky about it. And as he communicated with them more in depth and m the months went on, two things happened. One, I got sick of reading it because it wasn't, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I felt a little <laughs> awkward and it was, he's 13 and that's what it is. They're talking yeah. about poop and just stupid stuff. Like, uh, <laughs> it's not, uh, I was not, there was no need for me to con be concerned. Sure. The thing that, and so then I was discussing it with my parents and the one thing my mom said was like, when you were a kid and you first got your phone in your room and you talked to your girls or whoever, you know, that, however had that happened, we weren't listening to you. We weren't recording you. We yeah. raised you and we trusted you to make good decisions. So mm -hmm. that really brought the clarity to me. So now I don't 
uh, watch and read and um, sort of le- stand over his shoulder when yeah. he does his texting and stuff. Right. Um, just because I can it doesn't mean that we should. And that's where mm. I started. Because I can, I am going to. Mm. Um, but I've certainly softened that stance up, A, after mm. reading it for a couple months and seeing no harm, mm-hmm. um, and B, after realizing that I wasn't raised that way. And just because the technology is there doesn't mean that's the smartest decision, right? So sure. um, I don't know if you guys agree with that, but that's where I'm at now. So This could be like a much bigger can of worms kind of conversation though because like you could say like there's a lot more ways for young kids to to connect and be connected to now than there was when we were that age right like like it was unusual to go out and have conversation with strangers on the phone (laughs) if you know i don't think we ever did that when we were kids but like it it would be very easy these days through certain websites or whatever to be regularly conversing with with strangers and people that you don't know like what kind of stuff is being sent to young people. But yeah, outside of the sort of the stalker factor of that, like yeah. when I remember being a kid, I would hang out on the phone for hours. We'd just yeah. be on the phone. And sometimes we wouldn't even say anything. We'd just breathe but, and stuff. So I kind of that, get that. But yeah, with you know? people that you knew, though, with oh, your yeah. friends. Yeah. yeah, not with yep. strangers. But yeah, no. fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. so that's the texting or the communication part. And so that if we weren't on the phone, then we were either en route to each other's place or we were not hanging out, right? Yeah. Um, so I see how people would just hang out on texting each other. Like, yeah. you still there? Yes, I'm still there. And, you know, that just breathing on the phone thing, you know. You never did that? Come on. I didn't just breathe on the phone, man, but okay. <laughs> With your girlfriend on the other line and you're talking to her for 1230 at night and there's you silence for a minute I remember my girlfriend minutes. in high school. You're like, you still there? Yeah. My girlfriend Nobody in high school, who was much smarter than me, we, I, would, I would pull out, this is how nerdy we were, I would pull out a dictionary and try to find the most obscure words I could find and see if she knew them and she always, like... <laughs> she was on Google. There was no Google. It was like, free Google, man. But, uh, PG? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Anyway, anyway, enough about my embarrassing past. Let's, let's move on to our uh, third article we wanted to talk about. Um, I, this came out like about a week, a week and a half ago, and I just found out about this yesterday. Um, Amazon Echo. It's a new device. It's kind of a Siri-like device, I guess, for those who have used Siri. Uh, but it's an actual piece of hardware. It looks like a cylinder with a speaker uh, built into it. You you know, stick it down on your table at home, plug it into the wall. And the idea is you can ask it all sorts of questions uh, and have it you know, answer you, as well as it can take care of um, a certain number of tasks, I guess a limited number of tasks for you as well. So it's like having the amazing Crespin right in your house. I suppose, like or or <laughs> like a, some sort of assistant, you know, virtual assistant in a cylinder or something. Um, so the, there's a video if if anybody's interested to watch. There's kind of a four minute demo video you can see of the Amazon Echo, uh, but it shows a family kind of talking to it, saying, um, you know how. I don't know how many teaspoons in a tablespoon <laughs> the mom is asking at one point. How do you um, spell cantaloupe? How do you spell cantaloupe? The kids are like, uh, play some rock music. or um, um, my, my wife was watching the video with me at one point, and she was like, <gasps> when, when the mom said, set a timer for five minutes or something while she was cooking something, I, and my wife was like, oh, because like, that's probably what she would use it for, like... She likes to experiment in the kitchen, so it could kind of monitor all that stuff. Or add bananas to the grocery list or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, same kind of thing. So um, w- I, when I watched the video, I thought it seemed pretty cool. Like, it's, it didn't seem like anything kind of revolutionary. Like, it's not like this is, we've never seen anything that does this before ever in the past. But the idea of having something in your home that the whole family can kind of connect to um, if you need to find out what the weather is or set an alarm or you know, add things to lists uh, for whatever. It doesn't just have to be grocery lists, I'm assuming. Um, uh, I thought had a certain a certain kind of appeal in that, like, home of the future kind of concept, right? Of the, the smart, uh, smart home, smart appliances kind of concept. Yeah, it was a really weird video because as a marketing tool, they went through sort of... 10 use cases, very uh, in all in the same home with the same actors. Right. Um, so it was, uh, they were playing music and stopping music, and it was good music, uh, very generic sort of. Uh, <laughs> it, they advertise that it plays yeah, good music. Yeah, I they guess. said it plays music know. and good music too. I don't know who decides what Which the good is music is. So <laughs> arbitrary. Um, but I think the, the story that really struck for my wife as well, and for me, and I think uh, the, the biggest thing is the grocery store list. Mm-hmm. And the kitchen stuff where, uh, as I'm watching it, my wife watches it. She made a noise. I thought, there it is. That's, 
you there's know, the selling there point. There it is. Right. Please add something well, to the grocery list. That's a big one. If it's if it's um, something like your hands are busy, you don't want to pick up your phone. You know, if you're got covered in cake batter or something, sure. I don't yeah, know what chicken. to to yeah exactly to to add something to a list or to do whatever set a timer. Um, I, I think that has some appeal, and and it, I mean not just for the kitchen, right? You could be doing anything around the house, busy with your hands, and and not wanting to hunt down your phone to add something to your whatever app, and uh, to be able to just tell this device and it go, off it goes. Um, I think is interesting. Um, let's maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Beth here first. Could you see yourself having something like this in in your home? Or would you like to use a device like this? Yeah. So uh, I guess for me, I feel a little bit scared by <laughs> this device. Okay. Um, Why so I watched the movie Her, and you know they have the whole the artificial yeah. intelligence and sort of how that becomes such an integral part of people's life that they they think they can date it. Right. Um, and I liked then, that movie by the way. I thought it was very good. But I, yeah, I, I, I love it. <laughs> I turned Steven it off. I wouldn't like even it. watch it. Yeah, really? <laughs> I couldn't watch it. When he made the OS, and I was like, what? Wait, that? how did... I just thought they handled that so poorly. And I couldn't get I couldn't get the engagement. I couldn't drop my disillusionment. You know, okay. like Superman can't fly, that kind of stuff, where you go to the movies, yeah. you're like, okay, I'll believe he can Sus- fly. Suspend your uh, disbelief. disbelief. Yeah, yes. I couldn't do it. So, And I realized it, and I'm like, this is going to be a ridiculous movie for me. So I had to leave because my wife liked it. <laughs> oh, so. Stephen. Well, the rest of us in the real world, we love it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, continue. Continue, Beth. Yeah. yeah, but I guess, so. so for me, it's like you think about you know, why, why is Amazon all of a sudden getting into like making this device in your home? Hmm. And, you know, I don't think that it has the same motivations behind it as, you know, Apple with Siri. They just have this assistant that's cool. That's a selling feature Hmm. with, um, the echo. I think they're trying to get you to buy more things from Amazon, right? Like they're Hmm. connecting it. And so when you say like add milk to the shopping list, you know, Amazon fresh can be like, Hey, do you want that delivered in (laughs) half an hour? Right. So That's true. there's their control, like all of your purchasing decisions, all of a sudden, like they're listening to everything you're saying in your home. And like, mm. you know, Amazon's listening. Maybe if you don't even ask them, like, oh, like, what do you think about getting sheets, honey? Like, you know, what is right. you know, so basically a, the, yeah. well, to explain it a bit further, there's there's an action word or a command word that you're able to assign the echo that will, in effect, turn it on. So if I wanted to play music, I would, I guess in the ad, they called it Alexis. They yeah, named I think it. That's the default. The uh, default name. name so you would it, say yeah. Alexis. Alexis, play some music, and then right. the echo would start. So in essence, what Beth is talking about is because it's the device is listening for its name, it's in effect listening at all times. So uh-huh. every word, it has to recognize the word before Alexis so that it can turn itself on. So it's always listening. So as you're talking about whatever you're talking about, Amazon is gathering all that metadata of your discussion of milk and bread and cheese or cars or whatever you're discussing. So they're able to then... In, in theory. In, we, we don't know for sure how sure. much so, it is collecting or it's not. But yes, I mean, there absolutely could be the possibility if you're like, man, you know, I've got a sore back from that old mattress. <laughs> and suddenly Tylenol. you're getting mattress ads <laughs> being sent to you or something, yeah. right? Or, yeah. Yeah, so it is theory. listening. The question is, what are they doing with that, right? Right. Um, so, and, you know, leaving that up to corporations is always a... A scary proposition, I would believe, right? But you know, having said that, having said that, I would not be entirely upset by a device that picks up what my needs are and actually makes useful somehow makes useful but non intrusive suggestions. I don't want to be getting ads like I don't want to have audio spam thrown at me necessarily, you know <laughs> right. what I mean? But if you know, if once a week Amazon sent me an email saying, Here are some things you might be interested in that it's kind of picked up on, you know, hearing right. my conversation around the house or something like that. And some of those things actually are useful for me, like things that I, I probably should get. Then, I don't know, I could, it's I a, could it's see some sort of... It's a fine line because of, yeah. uh, pizza's here. Uh, what? Uh, yeah, you were hungry, so we ordered your pizza for yeah, you because well, you know. we know every Monday you order pizza. You know, So where's the line drawn, right, for your recommendations yeah, I mean, and your, the intrusion? I they're going to have to do some experimentation. If, if this, is, this is all conjecture as far as how much they're actually doing this sure. or not. But, so is that the yeah. creepiness or is that the fear you have of it, that sort of the listening all the time and yeah, what they're going to do with that? I mean, and that's that's sort of what they do on their site, right? They predict, you know, oh, you bought mm. this. Well, you should also buy like these things. So, yeah. Right. Or the know. people who are interested in this were also interested in that or whatever, right? Yeah, like having that yeah. on 100% of the time, like in my house, like, no mm-hmm. thanks. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to have to make any decisions at all. <laughs> you can find yourself, you know, with friends over being like, keep it down. The echo is listening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> don't say you like Coke like better than Pepsi. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's right. Um, what about yourself, Laura? Could you see yourself um, using something like this? I feel kind of conflicted because I feel like there's this inverse relationship where like, the more convenient and accessible these things become, the worse my memory gets. <laughs> so I can't like, remember okay. anything anymore. Just Google everything, and now I don't even have to Google it. I can just ask the room, mm, yeah. and it'll tell me the answer. It's true, eh? and that's yeah. That's something that people don't often consider is how technology affects like your own thought patterns and stuff, right? You think yeah. you're introducing a convenience, and really you're introducing a new way to like think less. <laughs> there was yeah. a, not necessarily there was a good. great conference I was at earlier that talked about design driving culture. Right. Uh, I feel like I was just at that conference this afternoon. Yes, it was wonderful <laughs> at your college. Yes, <laughs> cool. So that's a, that's a fascinating concept, though, right? So you've designed mm. something, the Echo, mm -hmm. and it changes the culture. We're not looking into encyclopedias anymore. We're not running to Google anymore. Even we're yeah. just asking the air, yeah. or, which is really <laughs> creepy. Thinking. And, you know, and we were talking about, about our kids earlier too. Like, but suddenly, like my son doesn't have to ask me how do you spell cantaloupe. It can just ask the room, and it and it responds. Or I mean, ask the echo. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And yeah. so, do do I become less valuable as an information resource now to my children? Because, or does that weaken uh, you know? your son? Because then, if he's in a room without the echo, he's useless. Then I don't think that. No. <laughs> it would be you funny know? if you see kids in school writing an exam and they start to, to ask, start talking oh, outside. Oh, what is <laughs> that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> because the habit becomes Alexis. so ingrained. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Why aren't you answering? <laughs> Where are you, Alexis? <laughs> um, uh, okay. Well, you know, some mixed reactions, but um, at the very least, I'd like to say I think I'd like to try this thing out one way or the other. If I'm not about to go out and pay for one, but if somebody were to hand me one and say try it out for a week, I'd be like, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to see how this changes my my lifestyle, my interactions, my you know way of of using that stuff. I this, wonder if for people who live alone and are kind of lonely people, if this would become like a <laughs> device they kind of chat with when they're mm -hmm. feeling. You know, the, the need for companionship. Yeah, there was an yeah. article about um, a woman's uh, autistic son who really connected with Siri. Mm. Um, and that yeah, was really interesting. Did yeah, you see yeah. That? yeah, yeah. That is interesting. Um, I would uh, like to sit down and do sort of the Pepsi uh, blind taste test mm -hmm. where you have the Siri voice and the Echo voice. Uh -huh. And I just want to listen to both of the voices and see which one I like better. I'd like to be in that A-B testing group to say, I like the Siri voice or I like the Echo voice. We should get Siri and Echo talking with each other and see and where see the conversation one, yeah. goes. I'd like to meet the two voice actresses that did it. You know, like, yeah, you never be, know. That would be neat. And Bart Simpson. Neat. Sure. Well, listen, let's let's talk a little bit with uh, Beth and Laura here now that we've uh, kind of gone through uh, all the scary stuff about uh, artificial intelligence and being listened into and on and everything else. <laughs> um, moving into a whole other space, so to speak. Nicely done. <clears throat> There's my segue. Drafty in here. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh. cute. <laughs> He's... He's famous for the, uh, the the puns. Yeah, it's a bit of a dadism, yeah, but yeah, no, it's all, it's all good. Um, so drafting space. Uh, now, I think I first met you guys like a year ago or or more at, at a networking event in town here. Um, one of the Hackers Nest. Maybe it wasn't quite a year ago, but it was a while back. And um, and it sounded like things were just getting rolling. And and now you've been doing this for a little while. Uh, maybe maybe just kind of tell us a bit about the the genesis of drafting space and. Uh, how did you guys come up with the idea, and, and how long have you been at it, kind of thing? Sure. Yeah. Um, so Your two-minute pitch, right? <laughs> uh, Someone no, no, timing. No. <laughs> yeah. um, so Laura and I, we studied architecture at the University of Waterloo, mm -hmm. um, and we did the co-op program. So we worked in a bunch of different architecture offices, and um, we were working, like, Laura was doing a co-op in New York, and I was doing one in Vancouver. Like, we were on opposite sides of the continent, and we were both doing, like, relatively repetitive work you know it's like like I'm doing a condo tower oh I'm doing a condo tower oh I'm doing like <laughs> kitchen and bathroom layouts and after you've done so many bathroom layouts you realize hey this is like there's got to be like a formula for this mm. and you build this mental model of like okay this is how I can fit the toilet in like this sort of room shape this is how I can fit it in this sort of room shape mm. um and so after we graduated from architecture school we said hey why don't we try and turn this into something and let's Let's write that formula. So let's never design another bathroom by hand again. Hmm. Um, and we're working on commercializing that now. Wow. So you guys knew each other before you were on opposite sides of the continent. I yeah, guess, in, program, in yeah. Cambridge. That's where the architecture school is. Yeah, wow. we're in the same class. So okay. we've known each other since first year. 
which was okay. like a long time ago. Yeah, seven years now, <laughs> yeah. I think. Did, did you know like early on that you wanted to do a startup together or was this something that just kind of happened as you were coming towards the end of your program? Or Well, we worked together in third year in a studio project and studio projects like take a lot of time. Like you're working 12 hour days for like mm. the whole semester. And wow. yeah, so we realized that we worked well together during that project. And so then we decided to start something. Okay. Yeah, that was a cool project too, because, um, it was doing parametric modeling. Mm. Um, and so what that means is, you know, instead of designing the building, you're designing like a system to design the building. So hmm. we made a playground and so you could give it any two points. So we said you can give it any two trees basically. And then it will build this like truss system and it will have all custom joints and like different wood pieces and it will go in like the spiraling fashion. Hmm. But instead of having to like measure out each joint, we just designed a system. So it was like you could give it any two trees and it would just give you all the joints yeah. and all the pieces that you needed to make that playground. Wow. And so that was sort of, you know, our first where we were doing some programming and stuff as yeah. well. And then we okay. had to 3D print it and construct it, which was fun because it printed all the little joints and wow. we connected them. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really fun. That was I think that was when it was like, okay, yeah, this is fun. We can we can work together well. Awesome. Okay, so how long ago did Drafting Space start then? Like, when how long ago was it that you said, all right, we're gonna do this startup? Like, we're not gonna get hired at other companies. We're gonna focus on this gig, and and just do it on our own. Well, we started working on it full time last October, and okay. that's when we actually just started learning to program. Okay, so. so so a little more than a year you've been at it. Yeah. So far, and you didn't have you didn't know how to program at all or very little before. Very little. Days? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So Self taught. Yeah. So so <laughs> just tell me a little bit about that process because I'm I'm going I'm, I myself am taking a programming course right now. Steve's learning it in school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I know when I decided I wanted to learn how to do some programming, I was a little bit overwhelmed with the options of like where do I start and what's what's a good place to start at and and all that kind of stuff. So, how did you guys kind of dive into that side of it? So we um, we went to this like local group in town called WatPy. They're the Waterloo Python group, and for mm. two hours every Monday, I think it is, they have you know people who will help you out if you want to get started on a project. Hmm. We went there and we're like, we don't have a project, but we, we're going to learn to code. Okay. They're like, okay, well, you have to start with something that you're interested in. And we're okay, well, we're interested in like constraints and like figuring out, you know, how to, in a couple of dimensions, like if this is overlapping or that. And um, the first sort of project they helped us do, it was like a scheduling app. Hmm. So you, you look at people's, it was in one dimension, just like, you know, time, like, mm -hmm. does this guy's, time chunk overlap with that guy's time chunk or like sure. are they scheduled in at the right time um and then so we finished that project and then we just sort of went off on our own devices um and was, and, was there a site like code academy or oh yeah something? we definitely use code academy we okay. did the whole python code academy <laughs> yeah okay. we did those yeah we did Chapter, yeah. and khan academy too there was like some good tutorials on there and a lot of, like, Google for everything. It's like Stack Overflow. Overflow. <laughs> Stack <laughs> Overflow, I was yeah. about to yeah. say, yeah, sure. But yeah. It, it really was just knowing, like, okay, we want to, like, write this thing. Like, we have all these rules. It's going to design bathrooms. And and then we came up with the first prototype, and it was actually, like, drawing these bathrooms. And we're like, oh, my goodness. This, is, <laughs> it works. this can happen. Like, <laughs> and we, like, previewed it in our 3D modeling software because we didn't know how to, like, render anything. So we and it's, it's using it. this weird library on top of Visual Basics that <laughs> no one's ever heard of. Yeah, it was, it was oh, hack, wow. but it worked. Wow. Yeah. It got that us very awesome. excited to continue. Yeah, yeah. Going. yeah having a That's small awesome. success early is really valuable, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so... And and so have you been doing all of the coding yourselves now since since you started? I know you have a few other people on your team now. It's just not just the two of you. Um, or, or do you have other people kind of doing that work for you? Have you handed that off or how does that work? I'm just very interested in the coding side of it myself. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, so there's a couple different components to our app. So um, there's the algorithm, which is the back end that actually automatically creates these custom bathroom layouts. Hmm. Um, and that was solely worked on by me and Laura until about what, two September. or three months ago? Yeah. Wow. Um, and at which time we brought on a full-time Python developer, uh, Thomas, and he took our algorithm that was running in like six minutes and made it run in like four seconds or something. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like... Optimized. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> so it was, wow. it was awesome to bring him onto the team. Um, and then 
like there's a couple other components like there's the 2d part where you actually have to input your room dimensions mm. before we can take that data and, and create a layout for you um, and so a lot of that's been done by two of our javascript developers um, and then there's the 3d stuff uh, so once you get your layout you pick it and you can actually see it in 3d and you apply different styles and choose different products and laura is like doing all of that She's wow. our, our lone 3D developer. Awesome. Um, and it actually works out quite nicely because in, in architecture school, we learned 3D modeling. Sure. I did a lot of 3D modeling. We both did it at our jobs and stuff. And then coming from a 3D modeling background into doing the 3D programming, I think in a lot of ways is easier than coming from a programming background and being like, graphics, 3D, like, what's mm, that? Like, sure. We haven't found a lot of programmers who, who are capable or good at that. And whereas Laura was able to pick it up. Yeah, the concepts yeah. are really transferable. Sure. Yeah, so. That's awesome. Now, I should probably have asked earlier just to explain a little bit about Drafting Space to Sell. I think we've picked up a lot about what it does. <laughs> sure. it so is it, is it exclusively bathrooms that, that you're focusing on, or do you do other rooms as well? Or? Well, at this point, yes. Yeah. yeah, right now it's just a bathroom designer, but we are going to expand into the other rooms of the house. Okay. So, yeah. so maybe just to go through a bit of the workflow then, is it is this something that I use on a, on a web interface? Is this like mobile? Is, or is it a, like a standalone program I purchased? Like how, how do I connect with drafting space as a potential customer of yours in the future? Right, right. Yeah. So maybe a, a higher level of review is necessary. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so drafting space is for homeowners who have no prior experience. Like they don't have construction knowledge. They don't want to go read the building code. Mm. Um, so they can come on to our website. It's draftingspace.com. Mm -hmm. um, and they can start our bathroom designer. Eventually we'll expand to other rooms, but we're just running a private beta of our bathroom designer right now. Okay. Um, so you don't have to download any software. It's just it just works. <laughs> Runs in the web? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So what you do is you input your room dimensions. You me you have to measure it out yourself, put it into the software. Mm -hmm. um, once you've input your room dimensions, you choose the things that you want in your room. So you could say, you know, I want a bathtub, a shower, or maybe you have like a custom size vanity that you want to keep so you can enter that custom piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just hit, okay, like design my room. And it comes up with well, it'll figure out all the possible iterations for how that space can be designed, mm. um, and then it will rank them. So it will try and show you the options that are the best first. Sure. Um, and then you can scroll through. You can see all these different options for your space, some that maybe you didn't even think of. Mm. Uh, you select the ones that you like the most, and then you can see it in 3D. Mm. Um, and so a lot of homeowners have a hard time visualizing what things are going to look like in, mm. in their actual space by looking at just you know some lines on a paper. Sure. Uh, so you see see exactly what it's going to look like in 3d and you don't have to like no 3d modeling it just builds that for you right um and then you can switch out all the products for the the different products that you want um and at the end you get a total products list and you can purchase those things if you if you want oh, interesting so is that part of your your uh, monetization model is to be selling the products through the site and take a commission on the sales yeah okay. absolutely so we do everything like we'll calculate the square footage of tile that you need in your room or the amount of paint that you need for your wall mm. we'll give you the fixtures that based on your measurements fit in your room and mm. then you can sort of scroll through those choose the ones that you want and if you want you can purchase them at the end okay or you can just make a cool picture and play around with it yeah sure <laughs> um so a couple other questions that come to mind then like first of all is it when you have the 3d rendering is it like a full color kind of rendering or is it like a wireframe or what what does it look like when I see the 3D kind of It's options? a full color rendering with like textures and everything. Yeah, wow. so it starts okay. off as basic. You get um you get just, you know, a, a simple blank model and then you can apply. So there's sort of two steps in in that phase. Once you've once you've got your layout uh, you then apply a theme to it. Hmm. So I don't know if you're familiar with like WordPress, you can apply like themes to your blog. It's sort sure. of like that. You're, you can apply themes to your room. So you, we have like the modern and the African safari and whatever mm. other different themes. Okay. And then if you're like, well, I like the modern theme, but that toilet is like hideous. Like I would never have it in my house. You can switch. Then you can swap then start to swap things out. Okay. So you can customize your style uh, to your own taste. So it's not necessarily just arranging the layout. There's a, an interior design aspect to it, I guess, as well, right? With yeah. color schemes and matching products and so on. Interesting. So one of the things I did in my illustrious past is I worked at uh, Alexanian's and sold flooring. Okay. <laughs> one of uh, the pleasurable experiences of selling flooring uh, is bringing samples to people's homes and uh, playing the color game uh, right. where you spend 45 minutes with 
uh, a customer talking about the color white. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so or, do you guys have concerns mm -hmm. about sort of a monitor and an RGB showing a cream swirl tile? And then when it gets <laughs> there, somebody says, this is not what, this is not the right cream. Right. Because um, so <laughs> when you get into colors like that, I've, I've felt that very acutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know for sure. And you're um, 19 <laughs> samples into the home. And, you know, usually it's best with two. Do you like this one or this one? Because if you go with four, nobody's ever choosing anything. Sure. Yeah, I think um, more and you have than, to make money at some point. Five right? choices, people <laughs> start right. to max out. So, what's, sure. what's that like when you get into the interior design and selling product from the site, then. Um, have you guys considered that or is that something that, uh, yeah, so we don't, we're not direct, like you can't directly order through us. You can right. order through one of our like affiliate sales providers. Mm. Um, one of them is Amazon, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Cause Amazon probably is listening right now. <laughs> you know, you know, see Alexa, yeah, that's right. order my drafting space order. <laughs> um, no, so so there is obviously you're, you're seeing something on the web. It might not look the exact same as when it's on your wall with your specific light. So right. that's sort of something that we leave up to the user is you should probably order some samples before if you're not sure or, you know, sure. make sure you have a good refund policy on those right. things you're going to buy. So you yeah. guys are arm's length from that process. Yeah, they can still monetize. They can take, they can take mm -hmm. that up. The customer can take that up with the actual supplier rather right. than you guys. Yeah. If it's an issue. Yeah. Right? So exactly. you say these are great tiles. Go get them in Alexanians <laughs> and then they can bring them back to me, the poor salesman who then yeah. has to <laughs> still do that sample game. Okay, well, get, thanks very much. <laughs> well, and this kind of relates to the other thing I wanted to ask you guys about. So if you're if you're kind of pre-rendering, um, you know, possible finished layouts, uh, you know, with with the different the flooring and the different models of toilets or sinks or whatever it might be, um, I, I, is it a safe assumption to say you guys have to get all that into your database somehow? And so. Like, does that all have to be manually done, or can you can you just get Amazon to you know connect to their database and just get three D models of all of their products that you can import into your your own, or how does that all work? Because it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> is I guess what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, we're currently in talks with different companies to get their models. Um, okay. Yeah. So so three D is a a relatively new thing on the internet, right? People yeah. are, like I. I've been talking to these different product manufacturers, and this one guy was convinced that he sent me a 3D model, but he kept he kept sending me a JPEG picture. <laughs> so, oh so there's definitely a, a, a little bit of friction there of mm. actually getting these 3D models and being able to display things in the browser. And it's not something that's just out there on the web that you scrape a whole database and you have all that information, right? right. It's, it's actually going to these individual companies and sure. saying, hey, we'd like to like license your... Um, models and bring them in like we can help you get more sales if you give us your 3d models um, right. and so there's some companies that are sort of more on the forefront of that than others and we do have some pretty big deals in the pipeline but i can't tell you exactly no of course, exactly of course. what's going on there <laughs> i right was now. just wondering from the technical side if breaking news on like, tps weekly uh PS <laughs> weekly <laughs> Yeah, and get the name uh, of the Lowe's podcast right at least. has yeah. just been signed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, don't quote us on that. We're just joking. Yeah. Um, Go buy low stock. Uh, yeah, because if, <laughs> like if, if you guys have to individually draw yourselves every single like toilet possible. Oh, no, like, absolutely not. Insane, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's all it's all data that's getting passed and it's it's coming from these product manufacturers. They're giving it to us in like yeah. a catalog format that we can mm. then upload into our system and people can flip through and they're all categorized by the size dimensions and a lot of that process can be automated. Yeah. Okay. And it, it like ensures accurate models too. Sure. So that, yeah, we wouldn't make a, wouldn't make a mistake. Yeah. yeah, or at least it ensures that they're responsible for how accurate the model yeah, is. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so now is this, your, is this the... You've already talked about this kind of being the monetization channel or one of them for for the drafting space itself. Is this the only monetization channel, or do you, are you going to charge a subscription fee or a use fee or anything like that? Or is so that we're keeping it, we're it? keeping it free for the homeowners. Um, okay, there's you know. We talk to homeowners and yeah, I'll pay twenty, fifty bucks, but that's not where the money like really is. The money is mm. I'm gonna go do a ten thousand dollar bathroom renovation and right. like if I use your software then you know, you give me all the products and yeah, I wanna buy those things. Mm. Um so the obvious and the one that we're focusing on as our primary monetization uh, strategy is affiliate sales. Right. Um there's 
you know, a lot of other places we can branch out from that. There's, yep. you know, licensing, there's referrals, you know, who's, who's going to do your renovation then if you have, you have all these mm, materials. Right. Um, but those are, those are secondary and right now we're just you know, okay. focusing on the, the prime one. Is there a potential like enterprise version where you could be working with, with interior designers, professionals who are operating in this space or, or with, uh, with other architects uh, or architecture firms or something like that? I, yeah, I so there, there have been some requests from different companies of, you know, can I have this? But it, but it really is a consumer-facing product. It's right. for the end user uh, right. because it's, it's so simple. You know, you don't need, you don't need like a, a background in this kind of stuff to just... Sure fly through the tool. But you know, just like you guys were saying early on, like as as architecture students, like you were you were like we want to make it so we never have to de- manually design another bathroom. Oh, I could see other oh, architects or architecture totally students right. saying the same thing, right? Yeah. Dra- Drafting Space 2.0 will automatically design parking lots. <laughs> yes, <laughs> never want to have to design one so of no. those either. <laughs> so Optimizing genius. large and small car ratios, that was like four months of my life. <laughs> oh, wow. So, there, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of different places, I, I spaces, I guess, in the architecture mm. industry that I think could benefit from a tool like this. Sure. And I guess once you have like the bathroom side covered, then there's there's lots of room to expand into other possibilities, like you yeah. said, right? Like the basic algorithm is there. You just have to tweak it for the other kind of yeah, options. Exactly. Yeah, Very interesting. Okay. So uh, you said you're in uh, private beta right now. Yeah. Um, so what's kind of the timeline then moving forward? You're, the beta is going to last until... When or do you have like a launch date, a public launch date set yet? Or yeah, so know? early two thousand and fifteen, we'll okay. be launching publicly the bathroom designer. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you kind of have to have those affiliate, uh, you know, deals in place first. That's yeah. So yeah. we're we're working on um, we're working on the products and the styles and yeah, mm. a bunch of different things that still need to be fall into place before before we're ready to launch publicly. Okay, sounds good. Now, uh, we had talked a little bit before we started recording that you guys have done a bunch of pitching and contests and stuff, so um, I'm I'm just interested for curiosity's (laughs) sake, like what kind of traction you've kind of got in that scene or you've won or or placed in a few kind of contests and stuff around town, I think, yes? Sure, Uh, so we've done several different programs. We did... um, the Velocity Venture Fund, and the OCE Entrepreneurship Fellowship, the OCE Smart Start Program, um, the Engineer of the Future Trust, right, um, the and Google. the Google Entrepreneurship. Wow. Thing. Yeah, boot camp. <laughs> boot camp. <laughs> yeah. So those are some of the some of the programs you've been a part of, and it, it's pretty cool to be here in uh, Waterloo, and especially in the garage, you hear about all the different opportunities that come up. So sure. you really are able to take advantage of all those obscure grants that you might not otherwise have ever known about. Well, and I think Velo- does Velocity not offer some uh, funding or, or opportunities to compete compete for funding as well? Through yeah, them? through yeah. The, the venture fund. Oh, yeah. that's it. you mentioned that. Okay, yeah. right. Got you. So do you, do you feel comfortable telling us how much how much you guys have been able to raise like through all these different uh, yeah, things? Yeah, so we've raised $100,000 um, wow. just in grants. Wow. And we have not raised any um, angel investment at this time. But a hundred thousand in like free money, essentially, free, you haven't had to give away any equity for any yeah. of that, right? Is pretty awesome for any startup, I think. <laughs> pretty good I validation, mean, I would imagine. Yeah, mm-hmm. pretty good absolutely. Idea. Yeah, so far. I don't know if it validates the idea so much. You know, it's not <laughs> it's not market traction, but it definitely is. You know, mm. people recognizing, looking at it, and saying, "Oh, this is this is a unique business opportunity. This is something that the market hasn't seen before." So let's, sure. let's stand behind this and support it. Now, you said you were able to talk to your market a little bit and do some market research and get some feedback. Yeah. So uh, in October, we designed 130 bathrooms, um, mm-hmm. and we're on track to design a bunch more this month, which is awesome because an individual designer usually does like I don't know, like 10 in a year. So we, yeah. like, we outdid them in October. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so um, we're getting a lot of feedback. Like people are writing us like essays in these emails, saying like, "Well, I like this, but I didn't like this, and I need help. Like this feature, it was really confusing for me, or like this thing was great." Um, mm. So we're getting a lot of feedback through that, and then we're also doing in-person user testing where we're bringing people in, and they go through the whole process, and we get to watch it, and that's very valuable. Like I would say that's one of the best things we have done is you know sit down and watch someone struggle in real time and try and use your program and. You'll sure. learn so much. Yeah, you got to sit on your hands.
hands. You're so want to go. Just touch yeah. your uh, yeah. dog. Yeah. Just, yeah. just yeah. let yeah. them struggle. Let them struggle. Yeah. <laughs> it's more value to me that way. Wow, interesting. Um, so, like, it sounds like things are going well. That uh, hopefully there's success in the trajectory in the future. <laughs> um, I was going to say, you know, when you talked about it, does you haven't really validated the idea? I would say you probably have validated the idea. You just haven't necessarily validated the product fully yet, right? You're still collecting that information. Yeah. yeah. yeah so we haven't we haven't monetized it yet. Sure. So right. we're we're at this the stage where we have a bunch of users who are really happy with it. Um, we have people who, you know, are telling their friends about it, all that kind of thing, and it's just a matter of adding the monetization piece and, and watching how that goes. Sure. That's awesome. And in the meantime you have a few more employees and you seem to have raised enough that you can pay them. Are you paying them or they're all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, WhatsApp, that's awesome. WhatsApp wasn't worrying about uh, monetization too much. They were going after users first too, right? So, yes, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So when you get your $19 billion buyout to uh, offer... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah unfortunately, bathroom innovations aren't quite as popular as texting, but... <laughs> well, you know, everybody uses a bathroom at least once a day, <laughs> probably several times a day, so... Yeah, it's you know, true. There should be, there should be people interested, I would hope. Uh, and we were talking about cool. at our design conference today, uh, yep. the fact that it's been designed for humans to poop in water and how uh-huh. that is possibly not sustainable. And I'd never really thought of that before. Well, I think the point... So strange. Yeah, not to be too <laughs> gross about what we're talking about. I guess. But I think you he know? was saying something like how we're the only mammals that... That do that, yeah. 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 But it's better Weird. than digging a hole in your backyard, I, I would think. Yes. Yes, I would imagine so too. Just a little bathroom humor for... Uh... Yeah, sure. Well, I'm glad that we got to dive down into that level uh, before we wrap up here. My 13-year-old would be very disappointed in me if I hadn't. Yes, fair enough. <laughs> keep, keep it up, man. Awesome. Um, well, listen, we're coming up to uh, one hour, so I think it's probably a good time to wrap up here. Um, and I got to give my voice a rest before it uh, completely dies on me. Yeah, you got a um, show tonight, don't you, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> now all, all I gotta do is read stories to my kids so awesome. it's all good um, so let's wrap things up here uh, let's say a quick special thanks to the Velocity Garage for uh, letting us record letting us record once again in their the, space the two here. guys that uh, Beth uh, kicked out earlier Yes, they were very gracious in <laughs> vacating the area so we could set up, uh, which is wonderful. Um, thank you, our listeners, for joining us for another episode of TSP Weekly. Um, please feel free to send us your comments, your questions, your criticism, your feedback. Our email address is feedback at tspweekly.com, or you can just drop a comment on our website, which is tspweekly.com. Um, we should ask real quick before we sign off here, uh, where can we find you guys on, on the net? I think you said draftingspace.com? Yep, is that's us. Yeah? Draftingspace.com. Is there a Twitter or a Facebook or yeah, anything else? Yeah, all just draftingspace, at draftingspace. Okay, draftingspace <laughs> Facebook is the slash place draftingspace. To <laughs> Perfect, sounds good. Um, well, thank you, uh, Laura. I'll, I'll say your full names. Laura Austin and Beth Neniger. Does Woo. it right? <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> it counts. It's one of those names that looks easy to say on paper, but then when I try to say it, it doesn't quite come over right. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, thanks for being on our uh, podcast today, guys. It was thanks great for having us. Yeah, That's thank awesome. you so much. Uh, our pleasure. So, um, from uh, myself, Darren Conley, and my co-host, Stephen Campbell, we'll see you guys all next week. Mm-hmm.